So it has been an absolutely insane 2024 election cycle. We have seen indictments. We have seen assassination attempts. We've seen a coup within the Democrat Party. We are now hours away from finding out where it's all going to take us. And if you're wondering like me where that destination is, we could not have someone better equipped to tell us in the studio today than the man who is joining us, Robert Cahaley. I call you the oracle, uh, the man who predicted the 2016 election on the nose, uh, one of the best pollsters in America, somebody who has been following this stuff, living, eating, breathing this stuff. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with us. Well, you know, every now and again, you, you make yourself, uh, you make your way to Columbia because Gamecocks are playing another game that may or may not win, but we're cheering them anyway. And uh, it was a good opportunity to come sit down and talk to you. Okay, so you're going to the game, all right? Of course, yeah. And uh, just got back from game four or five, which game? Game did... four. I have the distinct displeasure of never seeing the Yankees lose a World Series game and having watched them play five. So they really should, like, pay to have me go <laughs> because it's insane how many times I've seen them win. <laughs> that was the one game in the series they did win. And the yeah. one game they won is the one I went to. <laughs> well, you are a sports nut, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, we have kind of like party guests for, for our guests. And uh -oh. I, wanted to, I wanted to give this to you because I know that you were at the Yankee game it was October, Mr. October. There you go. Oh my man. lord! <laughs> wow, that's yours, brother. Wow. You know, and the thing is, I was looking for somebody else to kind of take this mantle, and if anything, I was thinking it was going to be Otani or it was going to be Judge, but it, it's like Freddie Freeman is now <laughs> the guy who's kind of has this mantle. It's really in, of just Mr. October. I mean, this nobody even expected this. I mean, the guy hardly played this season. It just, you know. Kirk Gibson in game one with the, I mean, the only walk-off Grand Slam in World Series history. The second walk-off home run with two outs, both Dodgers, both game one, and like within out same date, yeah. within hours of each other. I mean, just the ironies there were just, thank you. This is, yeah. this is, this is special. This is, this immediately goes to like probably the best card I have. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um. Well, let's dive into some of your history first before we dive into the election and the all the questions I want to ask you about 2024. But give us a little bit of your background. Your company's based in Atlanta, Georgia. You do work. Well, we're actually moving. Uh, you know, the thing is, we're moving it back to South Carolina. Uh, part of that is, it's just Georgia's, I mean, Fonnie Willis's uh, jurisdiction. <laughs> That's enough right there. Uh, you never yeah. know. And... Um, yeah, we're we're actually looking at some property to build our own headquarters. Uh, right now, we uh, have a, a branch office in Clemson, ironically, because nice. uh, that's where my house in South Carolina is up there. And so, uh, and uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the mountains of North Carolina, just something a little more convenient uh, than Georgia. So we're we're looking at probably somewhere in uh, Pick and Drove County, County. Nice. Looking at building a new headquarters there. Well. Politicos across the state, I can I can hear the butts clenching. Robert K. Haley back in South Carolina, they're going to be scared out of their minds. You run a, a lot of races in this state. You got a lot of history in the Palmetto State. Yeah, I mean, we back when we used to do a lot of campaigns, that was it was a lot of fun. And you know, every now and then we'll we'll, we'll dabble in some independent expenditure and stuff like that. Uh, it's still very, I mean, close to my heart, very important. I, I want to see uh, people succeed, and uh, I want to see the right things happen, and it's. There's nothing like South Carolina. I tell people all the time, like, this place is the ultimate training ground. I mean, there's a reason, you know, so many uh, South Carolina operatives from Lee Atwater forward have just continued to, to make their way onto a national stage. You see it all the time. And this is just, this is a blood sport. And we learn a lot. We get those early presidential co contests. And it's just, you kind of, people get the exposure as being good at what they do to national campaign folks and tend to find themselves rising. So it's not a surprise. I mean, South Carolina is, this is where it's at, always has been. Yeah, the state that picks presidents, Republican and Democrat now. No one has ever lost the South Carolina primary in either party and gone on to be president. That's right. Pivotal. Um, well, I got to ask you this. I'm a history major, so I know a little bit about history, Battle of Trafalgar. 1805. It was the British versus the the Spanish and the French. 
That's the name of your company. Tell us the, the history of that name and well, why you chose it. Well, I've always been a big fan of Nelson. Uh, Lord Admiral Nelson uh, was the head of the uh, British fleet. And what I liked about the Battle of Trafalgar in particular was Nelson was known for doing things different. I mean, the Admiralty hated him. Kind of sound familiar? And <laughs> did things different a lot. And when he took on the Spanish uh, and French combined armada, this is Napoleon's navy with a lot of what's left of the Spanish armada. So it was it was a battle he wasn't supposed to win. He was outnumbered, but he just totally changed the strategy. And it was this idea of being outnumbered, being outgunned, but using superior strategy and tactics to to build something that, you know, breaks what is expected, does the opposite of what is expected. And that's kind of what we've always tried to do in the political world is, is do things differently and in a way that you can prove can be successful, that it can only be attributed to the fact that you're using superior technology, superior strategy, and a better understanding of the lay of the land. Well, it does translate well to politics. And I've always, I've told anybody that listens, you, you're one of the smartest guys I've ever talked to about politics. And in fact, I once said that you were, uh, nobody other than Richard Quinn was ever at the level, at least in South Carolina, that, that you had attained. But um, yeah, there's no, we, we've had South Carolina, you know, beyond your, your layout waters. I'm telling you, when you look at people like Richard Quinn and Rod Sheely, these guys, these guys were geniuses at this business. There's no question. And a lot of us learn things, uh, you know, it, even working on the other side, learn things from them. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that Rod Shuey did something that I didn't like, but I sure learned from. Do you learn more going up against brilliant strategists like that, or do you learn more when you're working with them on a race? I didn't work with a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every now, I mean, every now and then, I, you know, I would work with some of them, but I really, you learn more when somebody beats you at something and when you're young and you don't know any better and you just kind of walk in there and you're a little cocky and they just kind of remind you that, you know, you're, you're playing in their universe. They're the big dogs. And that they, and they know what you're going to do before you do it. We miss those guys this cycle for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely, Big voids. Um, speaking of this cycle, we've seen a lot of sunshine pumping from Republican operatives, Democratic operatives. Social media is full of, of overzealous, uh, what was it, uh, the former Fed chair, Greenspan called it irrational exuberance. Irrational exuberance. <laughs> on both sides. But um, you're looking at numbers closer than anybody. You're, you're studying the lay of the land better than anybody. Tell us as you see it right now, what's the state of this race, Robert? Uh, well, we have a lot, an unprecedented amount of Republicans voting in the early, in early voting. And especially in places like, like Georgia is a place I've, I've paid a lot of attention to. And the ones that have voted are not, I mean, when you think of Fulton, DeKalb, uh, Gwinnett, and Cobb, these are the counties that the Democrats need to turn out big, and they have not been the one that were busting the norms on early voting. It's the other counties. Uh, I think the last number I saw on the black turnout was 27 percent. That needs to be 30 percent uh, for the Democrats to do what they need to do. And so these numbers, this was the record turnout. Georgia is expecting to vote more people in 2024 than in 2020 mm -hmm. overall. And so you know, I look at that and I, and I think, and I start seeing the numbers here in South Carolina and other places, and those who think this election is going to have a lower turnout than 2020, I don't think I agree with that. I think this could be the highest turnout election ever. Uh, you know, that we don't have any of the stuff that kept people from voting in 2020 with COVID and everything else, and, and there's a lot of enthusiasm, and it's not just... It's not positive enthusiasm, it's negative enthusiasm on the other side. I mean, I, you know, you don't hear, you know, Kamala Harris people talking about how wonderful Kamala Harris is as much you hear, we don't like Trump. And most of the Trump people, they, they get, they like Trump or they don't like Trump, but what they talk about is they don't like Harris and they're worried about what Harris and the Democrats are gonna do. And so I, what I see right now is this is a competitive race 
in a, in a few places. I, I, I don't, I think North Carolina, Georgia, and Arizona are starting to look kind of firm in the Trump column. I think Pennsylvania is kind of the one that could go is in the balance, but I think it's probably leaning toward Trump from what I've seen. Michigan could go either way. It's kind of up in the air. Nevada, although the numbers look good, in my experience in Nevada, what they will do the weekend before the election, what the uh, unions do is masterful. Uh, they know what every one of their members' status is, whether they've requested an absentee ballot, whether they voted or not. They will put boxes in casinos and collect them. They, they will go to the doors of people who requested absentee ballots that haven't sent in yet said, I'm here to get your ballot. Oh, wow. They will do something that can move the election two or three points from Saturday until the Tuesday. So they go to the door with the lead pipe smacking against uh, the pole. No, I think it's just to go to the door and say, it'd be really nice if your ballot was yeah. ready to go with me. <laughs> but so that worries me as far as predicting there, because that's going to be hard. And Wisconsin, an interesting fact, most people don't know, Wisconsin has same day voter registration. So we pulled the numbers on everybody who's registered to vote 2022, 2023, and 2024. Would you believe that 50%, I guess like 51% of all the people who registered to vote in the last three years registered on election day in 2022? So there's no way to pull that state. It's just, <laughs> I mean, that, you know, and what's ironic is like I tell people, uh, yeah, and they say, well, how did you have the best poll in Wisconsin in twenty? 20, I was like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, blind luck on that. I, one. <laughs> I, I, I just, I mean, you know, but the one thing is, is we actually did it right toward the end. And I guess people who were going to vote, who had registered and were doing the, or planned to register or whatever on those buses were, were saying that's where they were. I don't know what it was, but it's a tough state to poll. And right now, as it stands where it looks like it's neck and neck, that can skew it. So those are the two. Wisconsin and, and Nevada that I, I I just worried that trying to trying to give an accurate accurate number there's difficult mm -hmm. uh, and and there's still you know things riding on on the others but uh, you know if I if I just say the the person who seems to be in the best position uh, for electoral college is certainly Trump uh, people still do underestimate Trump vote uh, they say they may have corrected it I don't believe that because I think the biggest mistake they make is they don't know how to poll people who have a life. People <laughs> who have a life don't answer 25 question polls. Yeah. They just don't. I don't know, you know, you Takes can't too long. you can't explain that to these guys because to them it's like, well, you have to do this. Like, no. They just they're not going to do it. So you're not going to you're never going to get average people doing a 700 sample with 25 questions or more. You know, that's why we believe in nothing but a thousand sample. And we also believe in, you know, hitting people the way they best respond, whether it be a live call, whether it be a text message, whether it be an email, just whatever they're responding to is the way to go get them. And you know, don't stick with this hard orthodoxy of having to break it down where this has to be this. No, it's about getting them to respond. Mm -hmm. And the more people you get respond, the better numbers you've got, and the more ideological and geographic and you know, demographic diversity you have, the better your poll is going to be. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot on all of those seven swing states I'm you sure mentioned you are. in just a minute. But I, I wanted to go back to you talked about the early voting a moment ago. And I was looking at some numbers this morning. University of Florida's election lab, uh, more than 72 million ballots already cast, already cast. Uh, we've got among these states that tracked by party, there are about 36 million ballots cast. Uh, the breakdown, roughly 38% Democrat, 36% re Republican, very close uh, among the states. Shouldn't that, be near that close. Yeah, well, walk us through. I, I wanted to get your thought on those 72 million votes that are already in the bank. What can we learn from them about where the race might be going based on those? Well, you know, Matt Towery and I, um, he, work, he he does Insider Vantage Poll, and he um, we we work together. We, we do a podcast called uh, Polling Plus. Check it out. We get your podcast. Uh, type in the word polling with the first one that comes up. And we talk about this a lot and talk about every week kind of what we're seeing. But as as we look at some of these 
votes. What it seems is, is that the Republicans have embraced this early voting a lot more than in the past. And, you know, I, I hear all the time, but doesn't that make, that make Trump inconsistent? Because Trump said, you know, early voting was bad. Now he says it's good. Well, I, I, I don't just really agree with that argument. I think that you don't have to like the, you know, the infield fly rule, but it's the rule. And so you have to learn to play the game based on it. That actually wasn't really set up to do a designated hitter. But once that became the rules, they had to learn to win that way. And maybe if you win, you can change the rules, but you got to learn to win the way the rules are. And so you don't have to like the rules to embrace them and win with them. And I think the Republican Party has kind of made that decision. They're going to, they might not like it, but they're going to try to learn to win with it. The other thing is what we've seen that I think we can read by the early vote is we noted, both of our polls noted that the weekend, we were both in the field the weekend when the second assassination attempt stuff was going on. And so what we saw from the Saturday numbers for the polls we were working on to the Sunday evening numbers was a major move toward Trump. And we have seen that since. Hmm. And so I think, whereas in 2020, Trump got a little stronger toward the end and had, had you know, not so great late September and not so great early October, I think that has been the opposite this time. Hmm. I think he's he has had a much better, uh, I, I would argue that he has done much better then, and we'll, we'll know more about how this week is, is kind of panned out when we're finishing the field this weekend. But uh, as, so far, I think he's had a good, having that many votes in the tank this early for uh, when, he, when I think he was doing well, I think will will bode well for him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if election had happened right after uh, she got kind of anointed, then I think she would be doing much better. I mean, there was a point right up until about the, that a second assassination attempt, I told you she was going to win and she was going to win kind of easy. Oh, wow. uh, but I really have seen a real change. And part of this, any new candidate, you know, everybody's like, well, yeah, how can this be? And, you know, remember when we used to have these huge races and the new person would be like on top for a few weeks and then they kind of settle out. It's like when you're running a poll against a known incumbent and you put generic, you know, generic, generic Republican versus this Democrat, generic Democrat versus this Republican. Generic always starts to win because nobody hates generic yet. There's no reason to dislike generic. Our, we do not elect people based on which ones we like. We elect ones we like. We make sure the ones we like the least don't win. I mean, that's, as Jeffy Barber once told me, your friends will work till five o'clock for you to win. Your enemies will stay up all night to beat you. And that is about the truest thing I've ever heard. And that's a, a something in politics that is worth keeping in mind. And so knowing that, what we see is the more people learn about her and her inconsistencies, the more difficult it becomes for her. Because at first, what she was saying sounded great. And they and that's what we were picking up in the polls. But now we're picking up, we don't believe that she believes what she's saying. We think that she's saying what she has to say to win, but this isn't who she is. And and that's because they've this 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 poor woman has got a lot of tape of her <laughs> saying a lot of things. And it's difficult when you've been I guess it's difficult to be AG of California, to be a senator from California, and not say stuff that's California. Yeah, that's easy. And to that turn. don't work. You know, that San Francisco, California talk just don't work nationwide. Let me ask you this: So you talked about the hidden Trump vote, and I do want to get your take on how big you think it'll be this cycle versus the last two cycles. You got any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, in 2016, it was what we called the shy Trump voter, and but it was pretty much limited to the people who answered polls saying things like, I mean, polls where it was a live caller because it goes to what's called the social desirability bias. And that's when someone caters their answer so that the person asking the question will see them in the best light. Now, when we first figured out, I mean, you know, back in 2016, we we're still using the automated calls. 
and live calls. And so what we figured out in 2016 in the primaries, so why is Trump do three points, four points better on automated than live? Every time. Every time he was always doing better. And then when the election came, boom, 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 three states in a row, the automators were right and the live calls were wrong. And so that's when I realized we have social desirability going on. I didn't know what it was called then. <laughs> what I, what I, you know, I grew up here in South Carolina, and what I remember was what they called the Helms factor. And that is when Jesse Helms was only down by five, he was going to win the election. And so that was something I grew up understanding. I remember, you know, a couple of those Helms races like that, and they were like, he's going to win because there's just a certain segment will never admit they're going to vote for him. <laughs> and one of the things I picked up from Rod Shealy was he said years and years ago, he talked about using the neighbor question. Hey, your neighbor's going to vote. He said, you got to give people a polite way to tell you something impolite. And so the question is, well, okay, I understand that's what you think, but how do you think most of your neighbors would vote? So on our live calls, we started doing the, how do you think most of your neighbors would vote? And what we saw was in every single state, Clinton went down, Trump went up. And we could see those di differences. And the biggest state then was Ohio at an eight-point difference. And that's when we predicted Ohio not only was going to be won by Trump, it was going to be won big. And I was like, you're crazy. Ohio's a swing state. It's like, it may be, but it ain't going to be this time. Because, And it turns out Ohio was not a swing state, and he did win, win it very big. Now, in 2020, there was a lot. It, it wasn't much of it. it. It was a little more subdued in 2020 uh, that we didn't see a huge amount of it. In 2024, it's bigger, but it's bigger for a different reason. It's not shame, it's fear. It is literally fear of being on a list. Right now, so many Republicans who are for Trump are afraid of being kept track of. They ask, who are you doing this for? Who gets this information? Where does they it go? They send that to your pollsters. Yeah. Where does it go? Are they, they're replying to text or an email. Where does this go? Who sees this? Oh, Wow. You know, and literally questions like, well, where do you house this stuff? I mean, it's on Google Cloud. I mean, they want to know <laughs> everything, you know, and it's like they're nervous. Mm -hmm. They're extremely nervous. You know, in the way if you, you ever talk to like a, a really deep Second Amendment person, uh, it, I know I feel this way, that the one thing they like about states like South Carolina is there, there's not gun registration. Mm -hmm. they, they're, because they always say if they register how many guns you have, that's the list they used to come and get them. And so that's why people fear it. Well, they fear this for the same reason. And so many, it doesn't matter whether it's whether what they're right or not, they fear that the government will come and get them. They feel that big tech will cancel them. You know, they fear retribution. And so that's one of the main reasons they're hesitant to talk. And they're hard to get on the phone. And when you get people on the phone, you know, that, that start waffling and, and you know, giving you, you you know, answering like a, a unsure, the, all the things. And, and just when you can give them ways, and, and since we talked about the neighbor question, we've seen so many people copy it. Uh, we were the ones who thought of it. I told you Rod told it to me, so I didn't you know, I didn't think of it. But I, I had no one on the national level had been using it for years. Um, we have other ways we do it too. But what we've seen is a bigger hidden vote. Uh, I see a big hidden vote in Pennsylvania. I, I see a big one in uh, at Arizona and um, in Michigan and even Nevada. Now, is that reflected, though, in your surveys that you've done, or is it no. going to be reflected on it's election not, day? It's, it's not, yeah, I think, it'll be, I think that Trump will exceed where we are on most of our surveys if that hidden vote ends up being what I think it might be. Um, That's a big statement, Robert. Yeah, I think it could. I, I really do. And and the thing is, if we sometimes we're able to cajole people and get them comfortable enough to come back and tell us, but sometimes we can't. And so it, if I can't get them to say there for it, then I can't actually put that in a poll, but I can see that it's there. And I, I feel like that is, it's going to, I think it's going to be stronger than that. But the other thing we've learned is the Democrats are very, very good at get out the vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know the Republicans want to stand up and give them, pat themselves on the back when they put 30 people in a state. 
but they put 30 people in a state. The Democrats have had 300 <laughs> on the ground for 10 months. Yeah. So when you put 30 people in with, you know, six weeks left, that ain't the same. That's way more outgunned than uh, Nelson was. That's right. That's way more <laughs> outgunned. And the superior strategies on their side, too. Uh, when you, I mean, I got to see firsthand what they did in that Georgia runoff, those two Senate seats. It's like nothing you've ever seen. I mean, they're going to these people. They train operatives. The operatives are then trained to, to go to all these people and put some kind of program on there that harnesses all their all their contacts and can send them messages reminding them to vote and where to. I mean, just like this concentric circles that they can get going with very little effort is amazing. I want to ask you this question. We talked about this earlier, and you had mentioned something else that kind of clicked in my mind about all the film that's out there on. Kamala Harris. Talk a little bit about the impact of the memes, of the things people are sharing that aren't media coverage, aren't advertisements, that are just... Yeah, I feel like that's been a big part of this campaign because the, the, the Trump campaign has done a good job. The Harris campaign has done a good job. The main Trump, the MAGA Inc. pack has done a good job. And a uh, couple of the main packs with Harris has done a good job. But the the Trump campaign hadn't spent near the money Harris has spent on digital. I mean, not even, it's not even close. But what the Trump campaign has is so many of these, I can't, I don't really call them digital warriors. I mean, because it's everything from like. Dilly and those guys. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's everything like a you know an, an old guy that sees a video he thinks is funny and texts it to all his old buddies. Yeah, you know, men in their seventies getting these going. Oh, isn't that funny? You know, and and some of the stuff is is you can tell is created by operatives out there, but some of it's just clever content creators who just do funny things. And some of it's a lot, a lot off color. I mean, just yeah. just a little mean. And not the kind of stuff that any campaign would ever want anything to do with. But it's moving around the internet. When I was talking to some of the really, the Gen Zs, they were telling me stuff I could not believe about some of the stuff that their age group sees. Hmm. And I'm like, oh, God, I don't know what I would do if I got that on my phone. <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> but it's a, it's a lot. But it's, it's so, so much of this stuff is moving around and it, it's it's not regulated. It, it is, I guess I would call it almost like a digital, an unorganized digital militia that's out there. Just they don't really know where the battle lines are. <laughs> they're, they're just shooting, you know. They're just shooting anybody that like that, that looks like they're on the other side. We're shooting red coats. All right, pork. <laughs> guy wore a red coat by accident. He got shot. I mean, just, you know, it's like, you know, that was the what a great you know, way to describe it. I mean, it's man. like that's, that's equivalent like Revolution War. I, you know, the poor guy just wore a red coat. Sorry, we, we shoot red coats. You shouldn't want a red coat. You know, it's like, <laughs> they don't know. They're just out there, a digital militia. They're just out there doing what they can do. Everybody wants to be a part and they feel an, a part when they can do something. And that is one of the things that all this digital connectivity has provided. People no longer have to feel like such spectators in politics. They feel like they're participants. And, they, and in many ways, they are participants now. How instrumental to that militia has the unlocking of, of X been, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Because last cycle, it was suppressing narratives. Last cycle, it was blocking and censoring and, and, and silencing people. Uh, this cycle, it is wide open. How important has Elon Musk's purchase of X been uh, this cycle? I think it's been important not just for X, but for the others. I mean, you know, you look at what Zuckerberg's been talking about Facebook lately. I mean, they're doing all this, this interfering. I think it's the expo. Him buying X led to a lot of the expose about what Twitter was doing. Mm -hmm. And I think these guys in the digital world know there might be a comeuppance if they do it again. And once, you know, shame on you, but twice, it's starting to be, you know, shame on the regulators for not doing something about it. And I think that they're all a little worried. Uh, and not to mention, you know, 
whereas Trump's true social is certainly much smaller, it has become a place where they can share a lot of stuff that finds its way over to X. Um, and in many ways, by Trump doing most of what he does on True Social, he's not as overexposed with everything he does the way he was on X. So it, it, that's been beneficial to Trump, whether they realize it or not, for him to be mostly on truth. But yeah, it, I think it's made a big difference. And that there's just like, hey, nobody's going to stifle what you think. You're allowed to think what you want. You're not going to be punished for it. And the feeling that if these guys get caught trying to, you know, temper stories again, that it's going to be really bad. And that the other thing I think is that the guys at Facebook and the guys at Google probably know the reality of what's going on. What do you mean by that? The state of the, the race? The media or? can tell you all kind of things, and we all hear all kind of things, but they know what the real background numbers are. They know what people are talking about. They know what's being looked at, what's not being looked at, a way that we won't. And I think that they see a very strong movement for Trump and they don't want that to translate into a Trump presidency and a Republican con Trump presidency and a Republican Congress that has the knives out for them. So and so they want to try to play face. They yeah. want to try to play play fair. And I think what Zuckerberg did from Facebook is a first indication of that. They know more than we do. Well, in Bezos' column in the Washington Post. Uh, Absolutely kind of calling out the media establishment. Let me ask you this question. You talked earlier about the social putting its thumb on the scale, mainstream press putting its thumb on the scale. Obviously, in this day and age, sadly, that's to be expected. Um, we know that a lot of those uh, mainstream outlets are propaganda organs. I mean, the Washington Post at this point, my God, might as well just slap a, a DNC label on it. But let me ask you this question. When the election officials start to put the thumb on the scale in the form of election fraud, uh, and again, it was alleged in 2020, uh, Trump basically has said since that race that it was stolen, uh, rigged against him. Let me ask you this question. As we look at what's happening in these states, we've seen ballot boxes on fire in the Northwest. We've seen, you know, one voter ID casting 30 votes in Michigan. We've seen allegations of fraudulent uh, registration in Pennsylvania. How likely is it in your estimation that significant fraud will take place in this race and do you think that that fraud could end up being decisive? You know, I, I don't know that we'll know whether it's decisive, but voter fraud wasn't invented in 2020. You know, I think a lot of people know a lot about 1960. And we've always, I mean, ever since the first election, there was probably somebody trying to figure out a way to manipulate it. I mean, there's nothing strange about this. Uh, and voter fraud in big cities, the Chicago's, the Philadelphia, it's been going on for a long time. It, when an election is this close, that's when it's talked about the most. And the fact that so many in the media just shut down any discussion and stifle it only makes people feel like there's something to hide. I, for example, when... Someone says, you know, Trump, let's say any, any media outlet says Trump spoke about voter fraud, uh, you know, today in, you know, at, a, at his rally. And, you know, this, there, of course, the election was proven not having, you know, anything else they would say, there's he alleged voter fraud, which has not been proven. They wouldn't say it was proven to the contrary. But when they push so hard to say something is completely wrong, it just kind of makes people go, wait a minute. It feels like there's an official position you're supposed to have. Um, we know some things happened that were irregular. I mean, a lot of things happened irregular. The Hunter Biden laptop was irregular. Uh, I'm a big believer in the Electoral College. So when people ask me, I say, hey, in the end, the states delegation, I mean, the state legislature picks the electors. And whatever the state picks is what they pick. 
And so if there was voter fraud in Pennsylvania and the legislature chose to leave the electors in place that the fraud elected, it's their right as a state to do. So it really, in the end, doesn't matter whether you or I think there's fraud. It matters whether the legislators in a particular state think there's fraud. And if so, do they do something about it? Mm-hmm. And if they don't, they have the right not to. When the Electoral College has met, it is over, period. Nothing you can do about it. I'm going to believe it that Bush v. Gore was wrong. Federal government has no role, no role in determining how electors are picked. The Constitution says the state legislatures and the state legislatures only pick the electors. So the Supreme Court has no, no role in this. It does, it, it, essentially, because the legislature can pick any method they want, we just settled on 49 states at the popular vote and two states at congressional and the overall popular vote. We started that, but that doesn't mean years before. I mean, this was bought based on the College of Cardinal system hmm. of learned people in a room making a decision. And in the old days, the legislature picked, you know, the top whatever, you know, number of electors they had that they believe were the smartest people to send. So whatever the legislature chooses is what happens. So what? tell me why the Supreme Court has a role in that. I don't think it does. I don't think it ever did. So that's what it comes down to. Whether there's voter fraud is determined by the state legislature and whatever they decide is what they decide. So as of this writing, and we're, we're filming this two days before the race, uh, I want to ask you this question. We've got nine states listed on real clear polling as toss-ups. Two of those, uh, Minnesota and New Hampshire, uh, Kamala Harris has leads uh, approaching 5% according to the average of these surveys. So a lot of folks are kind of putting those in her column. But the other seven states, all within the margin of error for typical polls. I think most of your polls have around a 2.9% margin of error. All these races are are within that. Yeah, we're always under three. Yeah, right, right. Um, so, but if you look at in North Carolina, um, uh, 1.5 Trump, Nevada 1.5 Trump. That's well within the margin of error. Pennsylvania 0.4 percent Trump. Uh, then you've got uh, Georgia at 2.6, Arizona 2.3, starting to get up toward that upper end of the margin of error. But then Harris uh, up by small margins, 0.8 uh, percent in Michigan, 0.2 uh, percent in Wisconsin. Given how close all these races are, and uh, we talked about some of these earlier. And we'll put you on the spot. Take us through your uh, election night, post-election map. Where do you think those seven states fall and by what margin? Okay. Well, first of all, know that we're doing our final polls this weekend. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to date stamp this before <laughs> the final polls come out. Um, I do think North Carolina and Georgia easily, I think, are going to be Trump won. I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned with a win there. Uh I think that uh, Minnesota is going to be <laughs> Kamala. I, mm-hmm. I don't, that would really surprise me just because, I mean, even when Reagan's landslide, he lost Minnesota. So <laughs> True. Um, but like I said, if I had to say right now, just no one to know about what happens in Nevada, I would put that in her column. Uh, I'd put Arizona in Trump's column. I would put Pennsylvania in Trump's column. And Michigan being a toss-up, and that's just one that I that that might be the one I tell you. I, I don't know for sure. And I'd put um, Wisconsin probably in Kamala's column. Okay. Right now. And if things break that way, Trump's the Trump's yeah, the winner. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess definitely would be. So. Where should folks watching the early returns? I could, that's good. Where should they look to get a sense of how it's going? Yeah. New Hampshire's a great place to look. If Trump is only losing by New Hampshire by a few, like two points, or winning New Hampshire, get ready. Get ready. It's going to be a big night for Trump. Big night. Uh, If he wins North Carolina by more than two and a half, three points, because their votes will come in early, it's going to be a big night for Trump. If, on the other hand, 
North Carolina seems tight. Virginia is a blow away. Trump loses it badly. It could be a big night for Kamala coming. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that we're going to know a lot about Pennsylvania because of how they're going to count. Uh, that might take us a good bit longer. So that one's one we're not going to see early. If Florida ends up being tighter than it's thought, because remember, Florida does have abortion and recreational marijuana on the ballot. So if Florida would end up being like a one point or two point race, I, that's going to be a good sign for Kamala. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the places that I would watch. Uh, and as far as specific races, I would look to the Ohio Senate race because Ohio is pretty good about counting their votes pretty fast. If Moreno wins, and right now we have him down by eight-tenths of a point, I believe, so it's a very close race. If Moreno wins, that signals good things for Trump. That gives mm -hmm. a sense of how that, that rejection is happening. Hmm. So these are little things that you can watch on election night. I mean, I, you know, obviously you can be looking at like Bucks County and and how if if Trump is losing to the, the margin he lost it to Hillary, it's going to be a good night for Trump. If he loses it to the margin he lost it to Biden, it's going to be a worse night for Trump. If somehow he's winning it, it's going to be a massive night for Trump. Is there anything Biden can say between now and election day to further screw things up for Kamala, or has he already done his worst? <laughs> you know, some sometimes you just wonder. I feel like Biden, in many ways, is 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 the old guy that they took the car keys away from. Is still is kind of mad about it, and you know maybe sometimes he just decides to throw the elbow a little bit, I, or you know drain the gas out of the car, just, just something just. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even sure the trash thing. Like he's sitting over there, kind of by himself, doing some podcast or something. Like she's from the ellipse, and he's like, "Yeah, I, I'm gonna throw a little grenade in here." <laughs> he threw a big grenade in there. I, you know, so I just, I really, I can't. Sometimes I think that maybe he did that. On, I think he did that on purpose. I think there's a little hostility there. He doesn't like Trump, but he doesn't like her either. Well, and then you've got Bill Clinton telling folks they were better off four years ago. That's not exactly on brand for Kamala Harris, is it? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Bill Clinton <laughs> talking about the, uh, uh, the the girl in Georgia and how that wouldn't have happened. I'm like, oh my God, that's that's yeah. that's not what you that's not the way you win votes. Yeah, and that's of course the the murder of the the like university. In Raleigh. Yeah, the co-ed there in Georgia by an illegal alien. Um, Robert, let me ask you this question. I don't, I don't want to get too personal. You're obviously sitting here with us. You look great. Um, well, that's very kind uh, of you. Folks have been calling though. I, a guy called me the other day. Have you heard about Robert Kahaley? Uh, and I hope I'm not uh, invading or, or asking a, an inappropriate question. But folks have been raising questions about your, your health. And, uh, I just figured I'd ask you. And if, if you had anything you wanted to say about it, I'd walk us well, through. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess, um, this is, you know, there's a lot of people who, who know this. Uh, I've, I've been suffering, uh, since er early this year with stage four kidney disease. And, um, I'm in the process of jump through the hoops that are required to, to uh, get a transplant, and uh, that is very, it, it leads to very difficult uh, times where it zaps your energy, and this has been a very particularly difficult year, and it's really, a, I think if there's a testament to anything, it's a testament to having some very, we made some big changes in the company right around the first year, uh, very positive changes, and I've got a really good team and people that have been, I mean, like days when I just don't have what it takes to do much, you know, do some of the media stuff to, to you know, call them and kind of explain, hey, can we reschedule? And there are so many outlets that have been so kind to us, and there are some of the major, you know, hosts and stuff know about this, but it's just, you know, it every day is not, a good day and so, some days 
this thing zaps your energy and it's it's I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It's a difficult thing to go through and um uh, but I, I I'm hopeful that uh everything will 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 work out and um I'm confident that it will. It's just this is this has not been a regular year uh and um it's kind of good that uh <laughs> we don't do a lot of campaigns anymore cuz I do not think for one moment I could have dealt with the stress of spending the entire summer in the fall doing campaign work. I just don't know that I would have made it. Uh, and I, I can't literally say enough good about some of, some of the folks on our team. Just, I mean, everything from when I'm stuck out of town because I just, I don't have the energy to get back. You know, everything from taking, make, taking my dog to the vet to making sure everything is right at, at my house or wherever, when I'm not there. I mean, just all this kind of stuff. People have really stepped up, and uh, I don't think I'll ever forget the way that they kind of stepped in the gap this year. I've never needed the people around me as much as I have this year, and and I, I just can't say enough about how they have really stepped up, and I won't ever forget it. Brother, you'll be in our prayers, man. Please keep us posted on the, uh, thank you. the prognosis. If you get any info, let us know, man, because I, I know a lot of folks were asking about you. Yeah, I've heard some of the some of the really strange rumors. Uh, uh, somebody yeah. said you were already dead, so hey, you're, yeah, you're beating I, that curve. I, it was really <laughs> funny. I was on Hannity one night, and somebody literally called me, and they said, "Somebody told me you're on your deathbed," and I was like, "What?" So I don't, I don't know. I mean, that you know, the people are, you know, there's a lot of people in this state that are just nutty and do crazy stuff, and uh, and certainly I've been on the uh, I, I've been had those guns aimed at me a few times in life, in politics, and it, it is what it is, and that's okay. You know, I want to wish all my haters love. Well, for this all the tin, for tin foil hatters out there, uh, this is not an AI generation. This is the real <laughs> deal. This is the real Robert Kelly. Yeah, because if it was AI, I would make him much better looking. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, man, I appreciate you coming in. Thank you for this. This is just, I've been looking forward to this. I'm so grateful. We actually teased this on our uh, month in review, uh, having a big special guest coming in and um, uh, prayers with you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to come by and look at your fabulous new setup here. It's very impressive. So uh, Columbia will never be the same. We're getting there, man. And go Cox tonight. Yeah, go Cox, it's about time. We've had a couple close ones that, you know, we should have won. And um, and I'm just looking forward to what happens when they come back up in my neighbor, neighborhood and uh, come to Tigertown because I think it might be time for to send those Tigers a message again. Before you go, though, you bullish or bearish on Shane Beamer? Where are you on the Gamecocks? Oh, bullish. bullish. Yeah? I mean, here's the thing. I'm a realistic Gamecock fan. I've been doing this a long time. The fact that we're in some of these games we shouldn't be in. I mean, I was a Lou Holtz fan. We won one game in two years. <laughs> I see the improvement. Mm -hmm. And I know that he is at the heart of it. And so whereas I watch Clemson people turn on Dabo after one bad game, like I'm happy that there is a progression. And I feel like that he did not start with a lot and he has built – very well, and I'm I'm just impressed with what he's done, and yeah, I'm I'm very bullish on Beamer, uh, but I was very not bullish on the last guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, they both have uh, identical records at this point against top uh, top twenty five teams. So he's going to have to get over the hump at some point, isn't he? He sure is. But uh, you think th he can do it? I th I think he can because I think he's just a better coach than a lot of people are giving him credit for. And the fact that we were in some of these games we shouldn't have been in. It's impressive. I mean, that's why I've, nobody's taking us like – there's not a team out there thinking, oh, the Gamecocks, that's a week off. Yeah. And that's new. That's a good point. Robert, thank you. Thank you.